I'm in Roland Dino's lab at UCSF. I'm going to talk about a method that we've developed to enable highly accurate population sequencing using next generation sequencing technologies. And I'll tell you about how we have used this method to uncover, um, to uncover a role for the APABEC, uh, <laughs> APABEC 3H um, in riboviral infection. And I should say before I start that all the experiments I've done are with poliovirus, so a small RNA virus. Um, and so, for any of you who have ever done any population sequencing um, or next gen sequencing, you know that you know, even though they can produce massive quantities of data, uh, they do so with extremely high error rates. Um, and so, for, for single genome sequencing, this isn't a big, big deal because, um, you know, what because all of the reads that, you, that, that come from your sequencing data, they come from the same individual. And so anytime you have an error, um, it's very unlikely that you'll see it multiple times in your data set. And so you can just end up um, collapsing all the reads into a consensus. Um, for population sequencing, so when you're sequencing a RNA virus, for example, um, each read can come from a different individual. And so when you have errors, you can't tell if that's a true genetic variant um, or, or an error because there's no way to identify whether reads over the same region come from the same virus. So you can't correct errors using this kind of consensus-based approach. And so um, because of this, um, the limit of detection for genetic variants from populations is fixed by this, the error rate of, of your sequencing platform. And so we use Illumina sequencing, that's the most common platform. Um, and there, um, in general, you can't really identify anything, any frequency that's below about 1%. Um, and so for RNA viruses, you know, which have you know, some of the highest mutation rates in the most diverse populations, um, it, it, even with these really diverse populations, we expect most mutations to be between 10 to the minus 6 and, and 10 to the minus 4 in frequency. And so it's pretty obvious then that using the technologies we currently have available, it's not going to be possible to look at the genetic composition of populations. Um, and so this limitation was the impetus for us coming up um, with a method to kind of overcome this issue. And so what we've done, um, we've come up with a method we call SIRSEQ. And um, essentially how it works is we start with single-stranded um, purified um, virus RNA. We break it into small pieces and then take those pieces and circularize them. Um, we use these circular templates for a rolling circle reverse transcription reaction. And the, the, the cDNA that results is actually a series of tandem repeats of that circular RNA. And so we take these cDNAs, um, we clone them, and we sequence them just like any other mRNA-seq library, um, except that when we get the data back, every read has multiple copies that derive from the same RNA template. And so with all that extra information within each read, we can break them up, align them, and form a consensus. And in doing so, we were able to remove all of these excess sequencing errors. Um, and, and so, um, you know, I just want to translate this into, into what we're able to see with, with um, a real population now. And so I don't have time to get into, you know, the validation and the statistics of how, of how we define our new error rate and our new detection limit. But um, I'll just tell you that we're able to drop the detection limit four orders of magnitude so that we can see errors that are approximately one in a million in the population. Um, and so this is the, the important point is that by dropping the limit of detection four orders of magnitude, we can now see virtually all the mutations that are present um, in, the, in the virus population. Um, and so I'm sure some of you are sitting there thinking that really this, this just looks like a mess. Um, you, you know, how do, how do we actually interpret um, this just cloud of variants here? 
And in our paper, we kind of discussed this in, in more detail, I guess more of the math. Um, I'm going to tell you about the least mathy way we can interpret some of this data. Um, uh, so one of the things that we can look at are the mutation rates. It's pretty much the most fundamental aspect of, of you know, virus genetics. And the way that we're able to do this is by looking at the frequency of lethal mutations. So we know that lethal mutations can't contribute to the next generation. And so every generation, they have to be reintroduced. And the rate that they're reintroduced at is the mutation rate. So what we've done is for every type of mutation, we've looked at the frequencies of lethal mutations and just estimated the rates based on those. So I, what you'll notice is there's a huge difference between the rates for all the different types. Um, so this is this was a little you know shocking for us, but um, this is the way it is. So um, what's you know what makes sense out of this data is that uh, when we look at transitions, uh, which are purine to purine or purine to purines, um, versus transversions, which are purines to purines and vice versa. Um, as expected, transitions are much more favorable than transversions. Um, but even in between these groups, or within these groups, we see large differences in, in the rates. And so it kind of made us wonder, um, you know, what's the biological rationale for having such different mutation rates within the same virus? Um, and so we kind of got our first insight into, into this question by looking at the distribution of frequencies that we see in our data. And so what I'm showing you here are the distributions of frequencies of C to U mutations versus um, U to C. And if you remember back to what I told you in the previous slide, how um, lethal mutations are present at the mutation rate, you'll notice that for C to U mutations, virtually every mutation that we see appears to be lethal. On the other hand, for U to C's, this isn't the case. We actually see a much broader spectrum of mutations um, in, in different, in, at, at different frequencies. And this is, this is more what we expect because, you know, why would every single mutation be lethal? Um, and so this kind of made us think about, a, you know, a hypothesis for how this could happen. How could every mutation we see be lethal? And the hypothesis we came up with was that, um, that actually what we're seeing are not single CDU mutations. We're seeing clusters of CDU mutations in the same genomes. Um, and so this sounds a lot like what we see in retroviruses um, and some DNA viruses where APOBEC3, members of the APOBEC3 family are known to edit viral cDNAs and DNAs um, causing hypermutation. And so for those of you not familiar with um, Apobex or cytosine deaminases. Um, they catalyze the conversion of cytosines or deoxycytosines to uh, uracils or deoxyuracils. Um, this particular family of Apobex, the Apobex 3 family, has, been, has undergone an expansion in human lineages, um, forming uh, what's essentially a cassette of innate immunity genes. Um, since all of these genes are known restriction factors for retroviruses like HIV and some DNA viruses like hepatitis B virus, um, HPV, and adeno-associated virus. So um, since none of these are actually known to, um, to inhibit riboviruses, we decided we would just, we'd just try and knock them, all, knock them all down and see if we could um, find a difference in the, in the CDU rates. And so I was able to get greater than 70% knockdown uh, using shRNAs with apobex 3 b C, and H. And you can see compared to um, control uh, mutation rates, uh, the only one that affects the CDU rate is apobex 3 h So to confirm this, um, I, I got some um, apobex 3 h constructs uh, from our, our collaborator at uh, Mount Sinai. Um, and I actually ended up getting three variants of these, of these genes. Haplotype 1, we know, actually doesn't express very well. It's really unstable, and as a result, has basically no activity in vivo. 
Um, and then haplotype 2 and 3, they have normal activity. And so as you can see, um, when you have increased activity of apoBEC 3 h in cells, we see increased mutation rates. Um, I also have catalytic site mutants of these two uh, um, apoBEC 3 h variants. And as expected with um, this active form, well, with this now inactive form, we see the rates of CDU come back down to a more normal level. Um, and so uh, not only are we changing the mutation rate, but when we look at um, the distribution again of the CDUs, we can see um, with lower apoBEC 3H expression, um, we can see essentially that the, that the hypermutation that we saw before is kind of reducing. Um, so we believe we're seeing, we're seeing less hypermutation in these cell lines. And so finally, just to show that this is actually a biologically relevant phenomena, um, I measured the titers of a virus grown in um, cells with low apoBEC3 expression compared to control cells, and have shown that the, the, the titers increase with lowered apoBEC expression. And so just to sum everything up, um, we've seen that uh, CDU mutations detected by highly accurate sequencing um, look like they are actually hypermutants. Um, and that CDU mutation rate is modulated by expression of apoBEC 3H specifically. And that the apparent CDU hypermutation appears to be less severe when we reduce the expression of apoBEC 3H. And, and finally, apoBEC 3H um, expression reduces the titers of um, uh, riboviruses. So we believe that it's a new RNA virus restriction factor. So I just want to thank um, my advisor, Raul, uh, my two um, sequencing, kind of like our sequencing team. Uh, they helped me with some of those maths. And um, Leonid, who's kind of like my inspiration for looking at RNA editing, and our collaborator, Viviana Simon, who provided all the uh, um, constructs for us to use. Are there, <clears throat> excuse me, are there humans with mutations in APOBEC 3H that, so, such that it no longer works or it's deleted? And are those people more susceptible to riboviruses? Is there any epidemiological data yeah, on so that? Yeah, so APOBEC3H is, is one of like the more um, a variable APOBECs in the family. Um, so yeah, these haplotypes, they're not, they're, they come from our population. But I don't know if there's any difference in, in susceptibility. Thank you for a very nice talk. When you knock down the other apoBEX, knock the H, do you see less, more virus? I haven't, I haven't checked. I mean, we didn't see any phenotype in terms of the rates of CDU, so we didn't follow those up. 